What's up guys, in this video, I wanna go over a easy, a medium, and a hard example of how to find the zeros of a polynomial by factoring. We're gonna cover factoring quadratics, factoring polynomials with four terms, as well as ones with six terms. One that I'd give students on a test, so you don't wanna miss that one, because I'll tell you, not all students can handle it. But first, we're gonna start with the basic examples. Make sure you understand zeros and multiplicity and how to factor polynomials raised to the fifth power. It's all in this video. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so when we're trying to find the zeros of a polynomial, what we're trying to do is find the values of x that are going to satisfy the equation when this is equal to zero, not y, okay? So we should have some fundamental understanding of how to solve a polynomial equation up to this point if we're gonna try to attempt things to the fifth power. And depending on the degree as well as the number of terms we have, that is gonna kind of dictate the way that we want to approach this. So the reason why I call this a beginner example is because I have three terms. And what is the most common thing that we worked on when we had three terms? And if you're thinking a quadratic trinomial, that's what I'm thinking too. Right, what do we do with these things? Whenever you see a quadratic trinomial like that, immediately your brain should be going off factor, factor, factor. Sometimes it's not factorable, sometimes we do completing the square, sometimes we do quadratic formula, but immediately ingrained in our brain when we see quadratic trinomials, we should be thinking factoring. What two numbers multiply to give us two that add to give us three? Hopefully, ladies and gentlemen, we should be able to do that rather quickly, okay? So when I see three terms, I'm immediately thinking factoring, factoring, factoring. However, Mr. McLogan, that was easy. We did that a while ago. Now we have something raised to the fifth power. It doesn't look that simple, right? So here's a couple techniques we need to think about when we're dealing with finding the zeros of a polynomial, especially when it's raised to the fifth power or any other higher order power, is to look to factor out a common term. So example, if I had two x squared plus six x plus four, the first thing our teacher would say would factor out the common term. Notice that two, six, and four are all divisible by two. Right? And if your terms are divisible by the same number or variable, then you can factor that term out or technically divide that number out. So if I look at x to the fifth, negative four x cubed plus three x, I notice that none of the numbers are divisible by the same number, right? I have four, three, and one. However, my variables, I can divide out a common term. Now the variable to the largest power that I can divide all of these terms off by is going to be x, right? You always wanna to look to your lowest term and say, all right, I can divide x and x, x divides into x cubed and x divides into the fifth, all right? So what I'm gonna do is if I divide all those terms out, I can now rewrite this as a product. So it'd be x times, now dividing x, that's gonna leave me a x to the fourth minus four x squared plus a three. Now, since this is a beginner video, I'm gonna kind of rewrite this or just explain again the process that I just did. If I take a six and I divide it by two, I'm gonna get the answer of three. I think we can all agree that. This is what we call a division statement. However, a division statement we can also rewrite as a product. I can take two, multiply it by three, and that's going to give me six. I don't think many students are going to question what I did here. So all I simply did in this case, guys, was the exact same thing. I just have a nice little polynomial and some variables, right? So I took all three of these terms, I divided them all by x, and I wrote that x right here which is now rewritten as a product of what the quotient would be, right? Because three is the quotient of six divided by two. So when I divide all these terms by x, I rewrite that as x times the quotient, and that's still gonna equal what I originally had here. Now again, can you always check your work? Yes, two times three equals six. Does x times x to the fourth minus four x squared plus three give us our original problem? It does, okay? But now I have this factor, I still have this quadratic trinomial, and the important thing that I want you to understand when you see a trinomial is that trinomials are factored down to what we call product of two binomials. Now, this is a little bit more difficult than what we have here, right? So this understanding though of how a trinomial gets factored down to a product of two binomials is critically important. One main thing, we can always rely back on like FOIL, like first, outer, inner last, right? And that's why it's sometimes it's very helpful to kind of remember that when we wanna take two binomials and expand it. Because remember, our middle terms are gonna to add to give us this three X or our inner and our outer product. So the important thing that I wanna to bring to your attention, we know the first two terms always gives us our first term, right? X times X gives us X squared. So if I have an X times X, that's gonna give me my X squared 
However, we have something raised to the x to the fourth power. So we don't want to use a three and a one, even though by the rules of exponents, you add powers, three plus one is four. Because remember, the inner and the outer combine to give us our middle term. Well, if I have an inner and an outer term of x cubed and x to the first, they're not like terms. We need them to combine to x squared. So the only thing that's going to work is having an x squared and an x squared. Then the other thing we want to do is look at the numbers, right? Or look at this last number. Well, two times one gives us two. What two numbers multiply to give us three? Well, obviously three and one and negative one and negative three. Since they need to add to give us negative four, we know the only option, ladies and gentlemen, has to be a negative three and a negative one, right? So again, you can always, you can use substitution. Sometimes I, I like to teach that, but I want students just to relate this to your understanding of factoring quadratic trinomials, and then just make sure you raise the power to make sure it satisfies the polynomial that you're working on. Now, the important thing with finding the zeros of a polynomial by factoring is you create what we call the zero product property. The reason why the zero product property is so important is because when you have a product equal to zero, you can now set all of these factors equal to zero and you can go ahead and solve. So obviously we have x to the zero, that's gonna be good to go. In this one, you could use factoring, but otherwise it'd probably be easier just to use the square root method, add three and take the square root of both sides. So x is gonna equal plus or minus the square root of three. And then over here, you can also use the factoring or the square root method. I'm just gonna use uh, the square root method, add one, take the square root, x equals plus or minus the square root of one. I'm so square root of one, which is obviously just going to be a one, right? So we can kind of keep it in there. Okay, so there we go, ladies and gentlemen. We have our zeros here, our zeros here, we have our zeros here. They all have a multiplicity of one. Okay, so here it is. Doesn't it look so pretty? So again, we're trying to find the zeros of the polynomial by factoring, okay? So when we're trying to find the zeros of the polynomial, what that means is we're trying to find the values of x that satisfy the equation when it's equal to zero, okay? So we're not gonna deal with f x or y, we want it equal to zero. Now we need to understand, well, it's said by factoring, but even if it didn't said by factoring, we wanna try factoring first anyways. And so what technique can we use when we have four terms? When we were doing earlier problems of you know solving four polynomials, whenever we had something with four terms, I wanted students to always think about factoring by grouping, okay? That is a technique when you have four terms that you wanna make sure you know how to do. Don't worry, I'm gonna explain. But when we have something to the fifth, sixth, or seventh power, it kind of gets a little confusing. Usually we have something we can factor out first, like a common, a common factor. But this example doesn't have anything. So let's go ahead and try to see how we can do factoring by grouping for a problem like this. Now the one issue that I do have with factoring by grouping is when you have your first two terms and your last two terms are separated by subtraction, do not do grouping like that. What I want you to do is rewrite that as adding a negative. Because you guys would agree, five minus four is the same thing as five plus a negative four, right? Okay, so I'm not changing the problem, I'm just changing this from subtracting to adding a negative. The reason why I wanna do this is because the grouping technique tells us to group, or for four terms, tells us to group the first two terms, group the second two terms. And then what we wanna do is factor out the GCF from each of these. So if I look at this and I say, all right, let's just put our blinders on, between x to the fifth and x cubed, what do they have in common? What is the largest you know, x to what power that I can evenly divide into both of these? Well, obviously the largest term that divides into x cubed is x cubed. And I can divide x cubed into x to the fifth as well. So therefore, I'm gonna divide out the x cubed and I'm gonna rewrite it right here. Because remember, any division problem, guys, you can rewrite as a product. For example, six divided by two equals three. I took six, I divided by two, and that three is going to be the quotient. I can rewrite this as a multiplication statement as two times three is equal to six. So whatever my divisor was, which is our x cubed, I can rewrite that by the quotient, what is going to be left over, and that's gonna equal our original amount. So when I divide both of these by x cubed, what am I getting? Well, x to the fifth divided by x cubed, remember, subtract the powers, that's an x squared. x cubed divided by x cubed, that's going to be a minus one, because again, it's a negative. Over here, I have a negative x squared plus one. Now, the idea of factoring by grouping, ladies and gentlemen, is to get these two terms to be exactly the same. And they're almost there, right? The only difference is the opposites, you know, like plus or minuses are off. So what we can do here is factor out a negative one. By factoring out a negative one, I'm going to be left with then x squared minus one. I don't know why I didn't put this back in orange. I do apologize. We wanna make sure we get this color code going good, right? Okay, so. Here's the issue where students have trouble with factoring by grouping because you're factoring out the GCF of these two terms first, but then you gotta factor again. So you gotta see that these two expressions are separated by subtraction, right? So we have this expression, two terms separated by multiplication, and this expression, two terms separated by multiplication. But they share one thing in common. 
which is a x minus one. So again, I can factor out the x minus one, right? And then rewrite it as a product. So zero equals a x squared minus one. And when I factor or divide both these terms by x squared minus one, what's gonna be left over? It's in the orange. It's an x cubed minus one. Okay, so here's where some of the good mistakes come in. And again, after even this, I even have another twist that again, makes this problem so, so good. So, but let's first kind of go through the common mistake. So now we have a product equal to zero. A lot of students are like, all right, Ms. McGulligan, I got this. Zero product property, I'll set x squared minus one equal to zero, and I'll set a x cubed minus one is equal to zero. So I add the one, take the square root, I remember, include your plus or minus, so x equals a plus or minus one. I got that, and guess what? Congratulations, you are correct. Over here, I have a x cubed minus one, and then you say, well, if I did it with x squared, I can do it with x cubed. Unfortunately, you are wrong. You can't add one and take the cube root of. Now, if you do, you are gonna get x equals one, which is correct, okay? So x cubed is equal to one, that actually is a zero. But here's the problem, ladies and gentlemen. We have a degree that's raised to the fifth power. We know there are five zeros, real or complex. So if I just say x equals one and x equals plus or minus one, that's only three zeros, right? We need to get to five. So the reason being is there's no cube root method. What we need to do is we need to work on factoring. Just like we could rewrite this as x minus one times x plus one is equal to zero and recognize to see how those two solutions are, how could we factor down x cubed minus one is equal to zero? Well, this is a difference of two cubes. And remember the factored form for the difference of two cubes is x minus one times x squared plus x plus one is equal to zero. So yes, x minus one is equal to zero, so x is equal to one, but then also x squared plus x plus one is equal to zero. And for a problem like this, what do we need to do? We need to use the quadratic formula, right? Because this is going to have two complex solutions. So x is going to equal opposite of b, which is negative one, plus or minus the square root of one, or b squared, which is one squared, minus a four times a, which is one, times c, which is one, all divided by a two times a. So x equals, this is going to be a one minus four, which is a negative three. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, the square root of a negative three is i squared of three. So I have x equals a negative one plus or minus the square root or i squared of three divided by two. Now, if we're gonna write our zeros as a solution set, and this is where, guys, this is, this is the best part. So we have these two solutions, right? These are complex solutions. i squared of three divided by two. And then we have plus or minus one and then plus or minus one. Should I write one twice? Or what does it mean when we have a repeated zero? Students forget this, and this is why it's such a great problem to go over. Because remember, ladies and gentlemen, we have a thing called multiplicity. Multiplicity is when we have a repeated zero. So we can say a negative one, and then I can say positive one, but I'll put a multiplicity is equal to two. So again, multiplicity adds to your number of zeros, right? Because we know one, two, three, four, five, we have a total of five. So I can say one, two, three, four, but since it has a multiplicity of two, that means it's repeated. So again, still, we're going to be adding up to five. Okay, Whew. so here we go, ladies and gentlemen. We have a polynomial to the fifth power with six terms. Now, a lot of times, if I was going to put this on a test, I would have at least covered something that would be very similar to this. It's not something that I would stress a lot, but we definitely put it on there. You know, we definitely kind of cover something very similar to this. But the reason why I think it's a great test question is because a lot of times we focus when we're factoring something to the fifth power, we focus on like trinomials with common factors, or we focus on something having four terms and factoring by grouping. But being able to go through the process of factoring with six terms can be sometimes confusing or students just kind of like overlook it and don't think it's ever gonna come back to them. But this is a really good problem, not just because it can be confusing on how to begin the problem, but also it can be confusing on how to end the problem. Because again, our degree in this polynomial is five. So we're looking for five zeros. Now, even if we had four term, I always tell my students, look to factoring by grouping. But in reality, anything with four or six terms, you want to be able to look for grouping, okay? We just don't do a lot of examples up to six terms. And immediately what I recognize here is, well, cause six terms I can break up. You could do two, two, and two, and try to factor it that way. Or if you're lucky, you could do three and three. So I always like to start with three and three, and if I can't get my solution, then I'll go ahead and break it up to two and two. And that's actually the same thing if you have something to even with five terms, you can break it up so you have six terms. All right, so what do we do here? Again, just like we do with factoring by our GCF, we wanna say, all right, what common factor can I factor out of all of these? So hopefully you recognize, oh, I don't wanna set this equal to y. I wanna find the zeros by factoring, right? 
So I'm going to set this equal to 0. So I'll factor out an x cubed. And by factor on x cubed, I'm going to be left with a x squared plus a 2x plus 1. And then over here, that's actually just going to be exactly the same. So that's going to be a plus. Now again, I have to factor this out, right? You have to still factor out a positive 1 to show this x squared plus 2x plus 1. All right, now what I want you to recognize is between these two terms and these two terms that are separated by addition, we have a common factor of x squared plus 2x plus 1 times 8x cubed plus 1. All right, now in this example, what I want you to see is now I can apply the zero product property. I can set my x squared plus 2x plus 1 equal to 0, and then I can set my x cubed plus 1 is equal to 0. Now this, ladies and gentlemen, is a perfect square trinomial. And that's very important when we're finding the zeros of a polynomial, because when you have a perfect square trinomial, you're going to have one zero with a multiplicity of 2. See, this can be factored down into x plus 1 times an x plus 1, right? Or you could think about that as an x plus 1 quantity squared. The reason why that's important is because when I go and solve for this, I can say x is equal to a negative 1, but it's repeated, right? There's two of them. So I'm going to say with a multiplicity equal to 2. So when we're trying to count all of our zeros, this counts as two of them because it's repeated. That's what multiplicity is talking about when we're finding the zeros of a polynomial. Over here, unfortunately, we can't factor this down using simple factoring techniques. What we need to understand, and this can be factored down into the, di or the sum of two cubes. So the formula for that is x plus 1 times a x squared minus x plus 1 equals 0. Now yes, using the zero product property, x plus 1 is equal to 0, x is equal to a negative 1. Whoa, the reason why that's important is because, ladies and gentlemen, that's a repeat of over here. So now, it's not just x equals 1 and x equals 1 multiplies 2. Now it's x equals 1 with a multiplicity of 3, right? So it's very, very important. A lot of students sometimes will, will miss this. They might be good with the factoring by grouping, but they'll miss being able to count this multiplicity because we want to make sure we're correct. Now we got to find the remaining zeros of that quadratic. So I have x squared minus x plus 1 is equal to 0, okay? Again, this is not going to be factorial, so I'm going to have to use the quadratic formula. So x equals opposite of b, which is 1, plus or minus the square root, negative 1 squared, which is 1, minus a 4 times a times c, all divided by 2 times a. 1 minus 4 is going to be negative 3. Square root of negative 3, we can rewrite as i squared of 3. So x equals a 1, plus or minus i squared of 3, divided by 2. Now again, ladies and gentlemen, this is very, very important for us to be able to understand or to look at this and say that, hey, we have two solutions here for here, and we have three over here. So 2 plus 3 equals 5. And ladies and gentlemen, we have now found all the zeros of this polynomial function by factoring. I hope this video was helpful, and I'll see you on the next one. Cheers.